Miigwech. Bojo. Shabadaske gishko kwen na deshnakas, bodwe wad mi kwen da. Megaze do dem, mi mwa mako do dem. And miigwech, kinegego kami jong. I'm so grateful to all of you for being here. I don't speak very much of my language at all. I'm trying. I'm a a beginning student, um, but our teachers always tell us that it's important to use it whenever we can. And I always like also to honor um, the indigenous way of introduction of saying, this is who I am. I'm a member, I'm a Potawatomi woman, you know, I'm a member of the, of the Bear Clan and, and also of the Eagles. And it's important to say, you know, who we are, what, how do we see the world? Unlike in Western science, and I'm also a scientist, I'm a plant ecologist and a botanist, um, but in science, of course, we try to separate the observer and the observed, right? Um, whereas in indigenous ways of knowing, we say, you need to know who the observer is so that you can understand how it is that, that they are sharing and, and, and speaking. And so today I want to um, again say thank you for your time, your attention. I know there are a lot of things that you could do on a beautiful, rare, warm afternoon like this. So I appreciate you you being here. I also want to give my greetings and thanks um, to the original peoples of, of this land and um, the work that they do in, in taking care of, of this place. So miigwech. And oftentimes, as a scientist, I'm giving data talks. I'm not going to do that today. In fact, what I want to do is begin with a little piece of a story. And our Potawatomi people who you see here, and the, in the yellow is our, um, uh, our most recent ancestral territory. We are a migratory people. Our Potawatomi people were canoe people until they made us walk. Our lodges were built on cold blue lakes of northern Wisconsin under the birches and the pines, ringing with the voices of loons. And we lived among our clan animals, who are our relatives and who are our teachers, the bears, the cranes, wolf, and moose, until somebody else wanted that forest and we were marched away at gunpoint from all that we knew. And I imagine my grandma, her name was Shanoda, I imagine her hand just trailing over the plants of the leaves of the beloved medicines as she left them behind, calling her silent farewell to maples. And it was in 1853 that they were marched from Wisconsin to Indian Territory on what became known as the Trail of Death. It was like falling from the sky world into an unknown world, only there were no geese there to catch them. We should ask them about climate change. They lived it. What it's like to exchange a cool, oops, sorry, a cool, sorry, a lush forest for a hot, dry, dusty grassland. Lakes for riverbeds. Lakes of wild rice for sacks of weevily flour. Loons for, well, there is no replacement for loons. The animal teachers all gone and the clans lost their meaning. How do you heal your family without the medicines at your feet? The songs, the stories, even people's names, the man light, whose name was Light on the Snow had no reference points anymore. The spirits of the grandfathers did not inhabit Oklahoma and the missionaries were there to fill the void and extinguish the sacred fire. This is climate change. Our people experienced the ravages of climate change in just one year as they walked from Wisconsin to Oklahoma. And now if you look at the climate change maps of temperatures and drought, we will see that Oklahoma is now walking to Wisconsin. I wish I could ask my grandma, where does courage come from in the face of so much loss? What are the sources of resilience and strength? when all that you know is gone. What did you tell your children? So I know what to tell mine. All of us, we have lived these losses before of the hot winds that blow away everything that you love. And those winds are gathering again and they will blow over us all, every one. We human peoples must stand side by side, link our arms to form a living windbreak against 
those winds that sing resist, 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 and stand together on the side of our good green home. And when we think about the policies of removal, we don't usually think of them as climate change, but of course they were. Exchanging these lush Great Lakes forests for the grasslands before it all, before Oklahoma all blew away, just before it did. And now when we look at the climate change models, what we see in this example, here is Wisconsin, and now we know that Wisconsin is essentially moving south and is moving to Oklahoma, just as our people had to do. And so once again, we are on a situation of forced climate change adaptation. And we can think about how can we draw upon the resilience of our ancestors? Can we understand what it was that enabled them to persist in the face of all of this loss? And where does resilience come from? Because of course that is, is, is what we need together, is resilience. And one of the most important things to remember is that nature is a moving target, always has been, right? Temperature regimes, precipitation regimes, even vegetation regimes always change. But we have the opportunity to have our relationship to that land endure. And what we see is that it does. Relationship to land endures. Our, our covenant of reciprocity with the rest of the living world can endure even when the land itself changes. And that's really our, our, our thoughts for today, is how is it can we use traditional ecological knowledge for strategies for building resilience and maintaining this web of, of reciprocity. And as I say, I'm a botanist, a plant ecologist, not a, not a social scientist. Um, but when I talk to social science colleagues about these sources of resilience, particularly in the face of, of removal policies, we say, well, what is it that enabled all of the people who were moved to Indian Territory, to Oklahoma, to Kansas, and, and beyond? What were the sources of, of their resilience in the face of forced climate change? And of course, one of them was knowledge sharing lots of sharing um, between peoples who were resident in, in those areas, the Kaw people, for example, um, as well as the Homa people, and, and knowledge sharing. Not only knowledge sharing between humans, but knowledge sharing between humans and the land. The knowledge of the land, if people knew how to read the landscape and knew how to be with plants and animals and water bodies, how to learn from them, that very capacity to learn from your home place, to speak its language, both scientifically and metaphysically, if you will, that is a source of resilience then, and it's a source of resilience for us now. And to, to find out how are the ways that we, when we are moved, either by walking or when the climate walks toward us, um, how can we once again create relationships of respect, reciprocity, and responsibility between people and, and the land? In order to talk about this, I want to share just a tiny bit of the prophecies of the people of the Seventh Fire, Anishinaabe teachings with which you're probably already familiar here. And as you probably know, at the beginning I said that yellow diagram is where our people were from. Well, not really. That depends on when you ask. Our people began with our Wabanaki relatives out at the mouth of St. Lawrence on the, on the Atlantic coast. And it said that at that time, a prophet arose among the people who said, big changes are coming to Turtle Island, and you ought to have all your eggs in one basket. Some people need to move to the west in order to safeguard the people and to safeguard the fire. And so our people, the Anishinaabe, separated from our Wabanaki relatives and moved, as our teacher said, until we come to the place where the food grows on the water. And that food is, of course, the food that grows on water. Yeah, Manomen, the wild rice. And, and so that's how our people came to Wisconsin, is, is along this pathway. But it's also said 
that along that pathway, in each of the fires, in each of the historical eras of our people, um, it's, it's said what will happen to the people and what will happen to the land. And we can only tell a tiny fragment of this here, but it tells about the time when the um, people's uh, lives will change greatly as different spiritual traditions come among the people and separate them from their, their ancient ways. It talks about the time when the people will be separated from the land, when language will be lost. It talks about the time when you can no longer put a cup in the lake to drink and the time when the air becomes too thick even to breathe. And it says that all of that will happen and we know that it has. Here we are. We even are in a time, say the teachings of the seventh fire, when the plants and animals will turn their faces away from us. But it's said that at that time, all the world's people will stand together. The Zaganash, the newcomers, as well as the original peoples, will stand together at a fork in the road. And this fork is, is understood as a, as a material path and a spiritual path. We often think of it as the green path. If I think about that, that one path, I think of it as all like beautiful green grass, all spangled with dew. You could walk barefoot there. And the other path is black and burnt to a crisp. And if you walk there, it would cut your feet. And we know that as all the world's people, we do stand at that, at that uh, fork in the road today. More to say about that in a minute. But we do stand at this place of, of, of great jeopardy, as we know. This computer is in great jeopardy if it keeps doing this. <laughs> so how many of you here are, um, are science students, environmental science students? Just a few of you. OK, thanks, thanks for that feedback, because I want to know really how much to, to really talk about this. I don't want to, to belabor the point, but let's, how do we stand at this juncture? Let's talk about what climate change looks like. We've heard a bit of a story about what climate change looked like to our ancestors. But when we think about the anticipated modeled effects of climate change in the biophysical realm, a lot of this will be familiar to you. We know, of course, that already there's increased frequency of, of severe storms and very unusual weather. There's no typical weather um, anymore. Um, we know, of course, that altered precipitation regimes have come to us, places of extreme drought and um, places of extreme flooding, great unpredictability in the hydrologic regime at this point. And um, I live in Syracuse, New York, near Syracuse, the snowiest city, at least in the lower 48. So I can tell you there are changes in the snowpack and duration. This year we have a beautiful, deep, deep snow, but for the last, oh gosh, almost decade, it, that snow cover has been restless. It's like, you know, Mother Earth's blankets kicking off and pulling on and kicking off again. Um, so changes in the snowpack and the duration of, of the snow have, are already underway. We know there are dramatic shifts in wildlife populations. A lot of models of models and observation of, of changes in migration paths of, of a lot of animals, songbirds, their, their pathways, and their abundances are changing. As a botanist, one of the things which is of great interest is this notion of altered phenology. And phenology, as you probably know, is the science of timing, the science of timing of natural events. And when we look at the time that apples bloom, at the time that certain medicines are ready in the forest, at the time berries ripen, at the time birds come back, we know that at least in, um, on the southern shore of, of uh, Lake Ontario, spring has advanced a full nine days um, than from what it used to be in only the last 30 years. Why does this matter? There's all sorts of reasons, of course, one of which has to do with synchrony or asynchrony. What if the flowers come out before the bees do? What if the pollinators and the plants become uncoupled from one another, as indeed in many places they are already? Um, this can have, of course, a big, uh, essentially a trophic cascade and tremendous changes in biodiversity. 
Some of the other effects that we have, are already seeing for um, climate change, of course, are increase in the numbers and um, distribution of pests and pathogens. I was just out in Montana last week, a couple weeks ago, and we were talking there about the mountain pine bark beetle, which has devastated their forests, right? And now it has three life, full life cycles every year, when before it used to have two and sometimes one. Um, so that's a whole lot more bark beetles chomping on um, on those those forests. Accelerated life cycles, um, range extensions. Do you all have insects here um, that you haven't had in, in, in decades? Insects arriving? We sure do. Um, real, a real shift in, in biodiversity. And of course, what we also see is one of the combinations of more pests and pathogens coupled with drought regimes, higher temperatures, the fire regime and all changes. Uh, this is, of course, complicated by uh, history of fire suppression, suppression of the river flows, for example. Um, but we are already seeing great changes in the fire frequency. And what happens then? We have um, certain forest types being replaced by other forest types, indeed, by grasslands. How do we know a lot of this? A lot of it is, is directly observable. And a lot of it, of course, also comes from models. And what we're looking at here is just a side-by-side -side comparison of the um, projections for um, the forest that we all live in, the sugar maple forest, the northern hardwood forest. And these models come from the forest, United States Forest Service Climate Change Atlas. I imagine Canada has the same species at risk, probably, program. Um, I'd like to learn more about that. But if you look at the red on this map, that's Maple Nation. That's where the leader of the trees, who we say Ananamic, the first of the trees to take care of the people, a tree which is culturally very, very important. The climate envelope, i.e. the habitat for sugar maple, will essentially disappear by the end of the century. Imagine, imagine the Northeast without the blaze of maples. What are the consequences, not only ecologically, but culturally? And that's where we're going to go next. But it's really important, as we think about all of these projected changes associated with climate, um, climate uncertainty, climate chaos, climate change is not a big enough word for, for what's going on. In the, it's important to remember that native peoples, of course, have not been the, um, the industrial complex complexes which are producing all of these greenhouse gases, right? Native nations are not responsible for the um, production of climate change and yet will, are predicted to suffer and are already suffering disproportionately these um, effects. So much so that, of course, as you know, with the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, this has been brought up as an issue of international human rights um, when your land disappears because of the actions of other nations. And my social science colleagues have pointed me to some really good studies about what creates cultural vulnerability in the, cha in the face of changing conditions. And it's worth noting that geographic isolation is a big predictor of whether um, a, a community will be vulnerable to, to disruption. Poor communities, what we call resource shortages, right? Why don't we just say poor? Um, poor communities um, have lower resilience and, and adaptability, greater vulnerability. Communities who don't have a large political and economic voice and power suffer disproportionately. And those people who rely for their life ways on the land base and the integrity of the biodiversity intact are more vulnerable to climate change. Does this sound familiar? Um, this sounds like our homeland, of course. And just as we look at the biophysical impacts, that most of the models, most of the climate scientists are really concerned with the biophysical impacts um, of climate chaos, but we need also to think about what are the biocultural impacts in our communities. And here again, at the time when at home maple ceremonies are going on and it's time for, for tapping the, the trees, this is for us, the Anishinaabe people, the new year, when, when the um, maples start to, to feed the people again. It's, an, it's a cultural keystone species which is going to be walking away from us by the end of the, of the century. What does that mean? Of course, some of our um, 
uh, climate change scientist colleagues remind us that it's not all bad, that there could be some good impacts as well. There is the carbon dioxide fertilization effect. As we know, plants all um, need to have uh, carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. More of it, more photosynthesis in growth chambers up to a point. It's only experimentally documented until they run out of water and there are more pests and pathogens. Very short-lived fertilization effect. Yes, the growing season may be longer, um, but that means that soils will be depleted faster. Um, many, many things um, will change, few of them uh, for the benefit of, of the land or the people. And in fact, agriculture in uh, arid zones is, is, is predicted to suffer dramatically. One of the things which is most important to me as someone who thinks and works in the realm of ethnobotany and biocultural restoration is the way that the timing, remember the phenology of, of plant bloom, fruit set, fruit gathering, etc., changes. Already some of my colleagues in Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee territory um, and my neighbors at, at home are talking about going out to pick medicines in their usual and accustomed places at the usual and accustomed time. And you just know that's the weekend that you go um, to pick fill in the blank. And when they get there, it's already gone. The flowers or the seeds have already set. Their, their window of opportunity to collect those plants is changed. And so this, of course, for cultural keystone species, has powerful ramifications for the, the, the practices that rely upon those plants. And already we're seeing this. All of these distributions, be they plant, animal, fish, insect, fiddleheads, morel, mushrooms, any of these wonderful things, the changes in them have cultural impacts. And of course, when we think from the uh, Pacific Islands to the Arctic, we also know that one of the major climate change impacts is climate refugees, right? Already more than 31 million people just in 2012 displaced because of climate change. And friends, those are just the human species. What you're looking at here is a collage of some of the species which are thought to be most at risk for, for climate change. And this is just the uh, proverbial tip of the iceberg of species that are predicted, our relatives that are predicted to leave us, just as the seventh fire prophecies say. These plants and animals will turn their faces away from us and they will leave us. So our relatives, our kinfolk, are also in jeopardy. You hear people say sort of casually, well, we can just turn up the air conditioning. Not if you're not a human person. Now these climate change models that help us understand what lies have gotten better and better. They are pretty darn good um, predictive tools. Of course, there's a lot of unknowns. We really don't know how, um, uh, how carbon dioxide levels will change because we don't know what policies are going to be in place, if any. Um, but basically, there are pretty good predictors for the way that habitats anyway will, will shift. But my modeling and climate science colleagues remind us that there are a lot of weak points in these climate change models. There's so much that we don't know against the backdrop of a lot that we do. And one of the most important elements of this is that on these maps that we're looking at, the pixel size, the scale of resolution for these climate change maps is, Ray, you were just telling me, what's the, what's the number for this? Did you say 100 and... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So not fine scale resolution. Um, and so that's, that's an important issue because if you want to know and you want to be able to manage for resilience in your own place, you need to have finer scales of, of resolution. These maps are based primarily on, on these biophysical indicators of, of changed uh, precipitation, changed um, uh, temperatures. They rarely incorporate anything related to human cultures and, and people's coupled actions to, to landscapes. And they do not include changing, they don't include evolution, basically. They don't include the fact that many organisms have the capacity to adapt and change, either genetically or through phenotypic plasticity. And most importantly, these models 
have nothing to do with ethics and values. These are models that tell us how the physical parameters will change. Science is so good at asking true and false questions, right? But science cannot um, answer ethical questions, right, wrong questions. And so these models, while they have some power, are, are certainly limited. There we go. But if you look at all of the things that are on the list there, the things that are the acknowledged weaknesses in scientific approaches to predictions of climate change are many of the strengths of TEK, of traditional ecological knowledge, which is inherently scaled locally, right? You hear people, um, uh, hold, knowledge holders say, well, I, I can tell you what's going to happen in my valley. I wouldn't dream to try to predict what's going to happen in your valley. I understand this place and I understand it very well and can predict what's going to happen here. Um, traditional ecological knowledge by its holistic integrative nature necessarily brings together values, ethics, human uh, scale interactions with place. So TEK and SEK, SEK being scientific ecological knowledge, could well be good partners. But for the most part, TEK is, is made invisible in these climate change um, resilience models. So here we are back to the prophecies of the seventh fire. And remember where we left off, that all the world's people were standing there at this fork in the road, right? We know we don't want to walk on that burnt cinder path. We know we want to walk on that green path. And the teachings of the seventh fire give some guidance on that. It said that in order to walk down that green path, we can't walk forward. We have to, in fact, turn around and walk backward along the path that our ancestors traveled. And along that path, we have to pick up that which was left behind. We have to pick up the language. We have to pick up the stories, the ceremonies, the fragments of land, our kinfolk, the plants, animals, our teachers, each other. And only when we have walked back along that ancestral path, put those things in our bundle, only then can we all walk forward together on that green path. And it's said that the time of the seventh fire is now. And that people of the time of the seventh fire will need great courage not to forge ahead, but to first go back and pick up these teachings and then carry them into the future. I think about one of my great mentors and teachers, the late clan mother Audrey Shenandoah at Onondaga Nation. And she always used to say, you know, there is a reason that we have been able to hang on to these teachings all of this time. And that's because we will come to a time when the whole world needs them. And that's what the prophecies of the seventh fire tell us, that we have to gather all of those up and use them. Traditional ecological knowledge is a troublesome misnomer sometimes, isn't it? Because it makes it sound as if this is all museum piece knowledge. It's how we used to, how we used to do things. But it's contemporary knowledge. It's a way of living. It's a way of being that can propel us um, forward in a, in a good way. And so what are some of those things that we might pick up along that ancestor's path that we, can help us um, in sustainability for the future? Certainly indigenous science. Um, traditional ecological knowledge has always been a source of adaptive management for our people. If we think that, if we know that the agricultural landscape is going to change dramatically, well, oughtn't we to be, to be cherishing that knowledge of arid land farming of our southwestern kinfolk? Knowledge of alternative food plants, when we see that our subsistence patterns and many of our dominant crops are going to be moving away, you know there are a quarter of a million of flowering plants out there, and Western society eats how many? Do you know? Three dominant ones, three are way at the top, it's about 10. It's about 10 species. But of course, we know in indigenous life ways, lots of other foods and ways of taking care of those foods as well. This is valuable knowledge for the time ahead. And in fact, if we think about what traditional ecological knowledge offers us in uh, these times of, of tremendous upheaval associated with climate change, 
Um, we know, of course, that indigenous observations of climate change were one of the first red flags, right? I mean, who was it, after all, who said to the world community, the food chain in the Bering Sea is really changing. There is something major going on here. It wasn't the climate scientists, right? It was, it was northern native peoples. Um, so observations of, of detailed changes in, in, in territories and the biodiversity there can tell us a lot about coming climate change. It can, of course, help us reconstruct historical baselines. When we want to say how quickly have things changed, what are the changes that we have observed? Indigenous knowledge and material culture and the oral tradition are rich in, in, in knowledge about what it used to be like. We are talking about um, working at the Menominee Nation. A few years ago, we were working with sugar makers at Menominee, um, both new sugar makers and elderly sugar maker, makers who could tell us about snow depth and the coupling of when the skunks came out and the cardinals were singing, all of these changes um, of, of the way winter used to come and winter used to go in sugar time. Um, there's a lot of um, important ideas here. I don't have time to talk about all of them. Um, but one of the most important is this notion of learning from the land. This resilience, this ability to be able to read the land and use the land as a source of knowledge for adaptation, just as our ancestors did when they had to walk from Wisconsin to Oklahoma. That's how they survived, because they had that ability to, to be able to read from the land which is embedded in this notion of the land as knowledge holder and all of these plants and animals, not as my, science, my, my ecology science colleagues would call them, you know, ecological entities, as if they were objects. No, they're persons. They're non-human persons from whom we have a great deal to learn. So these kinds of perspectives are, from TEK are a great source of, of resilience. Social networks, social capital, governance structures in times of great change and, and adaptation. This is an arena in, given the history of Native peoples in North America where we have a lot of practice, a lot of practice. More importantly, unlike Western science that can do, get, that generates knowledge as knowledge for knowledge's sake, right? In indigenous ways of thinking, in traditional ecological knowledge, knowledge is always coupled to responsibility. And I would say that that teaching, that coupling, that knowledge is not generated nor shared until the recipients of that knowledge are known to be responsible for that knowledge. This is a teaching that could have saved us a great deal of pain from where we are today. So the most valuable resources for climate change resilience, perhaps in addition to those we've mentioned already, are what we call the teachings that are associated with our original instructions. These are the teachings that are present in our creation stories and in our most fundamental teachings, just a few of which I'll share here. Both Anishinaabe people and Haudenosaunee people share the teaching of one bowl, one spoon. The understanding that the earth and everything that comes to us are gifts. These are gifts, they're not commodities, they're not property, they are gifts to human people. And that we can treat and understand the earth as a bowl of berries, full of all these rich gifts, sweet gifts from the earth. There's just one bowl, and we're responsible for filling that bowl, keeping that bowl filled. The other important feature of the one bowl, one spoon teachings is that there's just one spoon. And it's the same size for everybody. We all share the gifts of the earth with one spoon. Not a little tiny teaspoon for some and a great big gouging shovel for others. One bowl, one spoon. These are teachings that can help us in the coming times. As a plant person, as a botanist, I think another set of our original instructions the honorable harvest can be tools for climate change resilience. The honorable harvest are a set of unwritten guidelines that gatherers, and many times hunters and fishers, abide by. But what I can tell you about is the teachings that have been shared with me associated with plant gathering. 
And there's the acknowledgement that we as human people, uh, we're heterotrophs, right? We're consumers. We have to take other lives in order to live because unfortunately we cannot photosynthesize. But our kinfolk can. And so it matters how we take from the world. And so I'm told that when I go to pick berries, let's say, or to go pick medicines, we're told that you never take the first one. You come into that field, into that forest, and you reach that first one that you pass it by. Why is that? It might be the last one. It's an inherent salt of strength, a cultural conservation tool, if you will. But it's also ancestral. It's ancestral remembering that these plants are understood as persons, non human persons their own ways, their own agency. Now when you get to the plant, maybe the fourth one that you want to harvest, we're told that we ask permission, right? You actually address that plant, you introduce yourself, you say, here I am, and this is what I need. And you ask that plant whether you can have that root, whether it would give you those berries. Now I know in the Western ways, if you go out in the woods and start talking to plants, people will think you're crazy. But in our way, it's just good manners. Just good manners. You would no more go into your grandmother's house and just start rifling through her cupboards, right? And looking for the cookies. You wouldn't do that. Well, it's really no different with grandmother Earth. You just don't go looking for the cookies and take whatever you want. You ask permission. And if you're going to ask permission, you have to listen for the answer. And how do you do that? How do you listen for the answer, whether it's okay to take these roots or pick these berries? There's a lot of teachings in that, in just that question. How do you listen for the answer? And one of them is straightforward empiricism. You look around and you observe the health of that population, how many there are, are they diseased, are they growing well, is the infrastructure of that population looking good to me, of course, since we share that with you. But there are also more intuitive ways, um, metaphorical ways, symbolic ways, if you will, um, of listening to those plants and hearing what they have to say. Can you or can you not take them? Imagine if we extended the honorable harvest to law and policy. Imagine if you were a developer and you had your eye on this big, beautiful meadow and you wanted to put in a shopping mall there and you had to go ask permission of the meadow larks and the buttercups and the, and the hickories. And listen to the answer. These may seem like they're these archaic ways of being, but they have a lot of power in our uh, current circumstances. If the plant grants you permission, you only take what you need, right? Never more than that. And different people have different teachings, but certainly never more than half. Um, you just take the little bit that you need. And every single thing that you take must be used. Um, can never be wasted because it would be wasting a life. It would be wasting a gift of the life of, of those plants. Share everything that you've taken because that's not property. These are gifts. These are lives of other beings. Just as they shared with you, you have to share with everybody else. Be grateful. Always return thanks. Minimize harm. Don't use a big old shovel with a little digging stick will do. Take in such a way that you don't deplete the, 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 the place. And very importantly, take only that which is given to us. This last teaching is something that um, was shared with me as, say, as being said that that's an older teaching even than take only what you need. Take only that which was given to you, which really is an interesting philosophical and material a puzzle to understand what it is that's given to us. More to say about that later. And most importantly, always to reciprocate the gift that you can't take without giving back. And there are many traditional protocols for how one gives back. These are tools for resilience in a time of changing climate as well, to reestablish that web of reciprocity that we talked about at the beginning, of that ability to um, behave responsibly toward the land, to live in cultures of gratitude. And gratitude um, is, is often thought sort of to be uh, 
in a sense, kind of a weak response to something as dramatic as climate change. But it is, of course, gratitude that leads to self-restraint. Gratitude that leads to your understanding that you really already have everything that you need. You really don't need any more. And gratitude is also a gateway to reciprocity. Because we know what, when someone gives us a gift, what is our natural inclination? To, to be grateful and to return the gift, right? Right. We cannot continue as human people to ignore our role as givers. Um, most um, dominant society media tell us that we are not even people anymore. We are consumers, right? That's what we are. We're consumers. We're also givers. And we forget that. In fact, even in our definitions of sustainability, which you can't really read here, but that's okay because you know what all these definitions are about, right? This is the free word sustainability. What does it really mean? Anyway, um, and I think it was at the conference that you and I met at where Carol Crow told this wonderful story about um, going to her band council to say, I want to go to a sustainability elders said, well, what's sustainability? And so she gave them these definitions, you know, this you know, living in such a way that we find the formula so that the earth can continue to support us into the future, you know. And her elders said to her, really? Yes, you go there. But you go there and you educate them that, in fact, what we need to be thinking about is not how we can continue to take from the earth, but what it is that we as human people have to give to the earth. We're always about what more can we take from the earth and who asks themselves or asks each other, what does the earth ask of us? What is it that we have to give back? That's sustainability. So even our definitions of, of green sustainability are all about taking and not about reciprocity. That's why these teachings from along that ancestral path are, lead us to a change in worldview, a change in, in our relationship to place and to one another that can lead us to something more like real sustainability. We need another word. Anyway, um, when we think about the vulnerability of forests in the face of climate change, for example, we know that the simpler the ecosystem, the more vulnerable it is. This is why, of course, we're seeing dramatic changes first in island ecosystems and far northern ecosystems because there's less um, complexity to absorb those dynamic shifts. Um, so we know this. But I think we also then have to think about intellectual diversity. Isn't that the same? You know, for human societies to be more resilient in the face of climate change, we need a diversity of ideas. And here at the Center for Aboriginal Initiatives, I don't need to tell you that. Um, this is already part of, of your mission. How am I doing on time? I have, OK, OK. OK, thanks. Let me just finish up then. OK. So if we are to move toward this other definition of sustainability, if we are to embrace cultural diversity and coming up with sustainable solutions for um, adaptation to climate change, I love Kenny Ossiebel's words here. It's such a quote. This falls in the, in the category of, gosh, I wish I'd written that. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to need the enduring knowledge of indigenous science as the as well as the best of leading edge Western science. It's high tech meets high tech. Um, and that is indeed where we're, um, what we're advocating here, both in, in, in your Center for Aboriginal Initiatives and our work in Syracuse at the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. And the question that um, many of us are, are, are working on philosophically and materially, Deb has written beautifully about these issues, is how do we construct right relationship between traditional ecological knowledge and, and Western science. Because we know that right, oh, um, yeah, some of the language around this relationship between these, these different knowledge systems, between TEK and SEK, you see some of the phrases here that appear in, in the literature, um, many of them problematic. The one that I find most problematic is this idea of knowledge blending. 
Yeah, good, you all shook your head. No, um, because uh, when, why not knowledge blending? Because, of course, the integrity of one knowledge system is lost in, in, in the other. So what we're really thinking about is what are the ways that we can have knowledge sovereignty and having these sovereign knowledge systems work together, not be blended, but work together. Because they certainly aren't now. And at least in most of, of my university and universities the world over, science is really understood metaphorically, I really think in metaphors, science as a fortress. Um, and it's something of an intellectual monoculture, isn't it? Um, and when we think about this fortress metaphor, why a fortress? Because it's built up brick by brick in reductionist knowledge systems, right? Um, but those bricks, they could be build anything, each little piece, each little scientific study, each little um, quantum of knowledge could be built, could be used to build different things. But we tend to build fortresses. Like a fortress, science is done by specialized workers. Um, and there is one way to do it, the scientific method. It's a fairly structured, regimented way to um, generate knowledge. And that knowledge tends to become property and commodified. And so this is why we think of the knowledge uh, fortress of science, especially because those walls around the fortress are built by a language of exclusion, aren't they? Um, and a language of exclusion so that I, as a scientist, am asked to write papers that the other 50 plant ecologists can read and nobody else. Um, to me, that's wrong. That is not a culture of reciprocity. If, as a scientist, I have been privileged to sit with plants and with the living world and learn their stories, it seems to me that I have the responsibility to then share that with, with everybody, not just with, with scientists. I'm going to, because I want to wrap up, I'm going to, maybe we can talk about some of this in your class tomorrow. Um, but that fortress is crumbling. We understand that science alone is not the only way of knowing. It, is, it has reached us into, into great understanding, but it has also brought us down some dangerous pathways. So can we turn to TEK? Can we turn to indigenous models um, for understanding knowledge uh, sovereignty? And of course, the two row wampum, the Gaswenta as a, as a model for um, knowledge sovereignty is something that Deb has written about so beautifully, as, as have others. And um, are you all familiar with this already? Yeah, OK, good. So in, essentially, what we're seeing here is on the river of life, there is the, the canoe pathway and the ship pathway, right? Um, and that these two knowledges coexist. They're autonomous. The people in the ship agree not to, to steer the canoe and, and vice versa. It's a model of, of mutual respect. Um, but as these two vessels share the river of life in this coexistence between knowledge systems as well as between peoples and political entities, we know, of course, that this is what, in many cases, the river of life has come to look like. And so, to me, this opens serious questions about the limitations of autonomous models of knowledge systems. Do we have an ethical responsibility to steer the ship before it drowns us all, before it continues to, to ruin the rivers of life? And so when I'm faced with a dilemma like this of so many dimensions, what should be the right relationship between knowledge systems, if not sovereignty and, and autonomy, I look to the plants. And beyond two-row thinking, we look to the plants as our teachers, you know, go skip right ahead here, to thinking about the Three Sisters Garden as another model of knowledge symbiosis. Just as these three plants work together in complementary fashion to feed one another in, an, in a garden polyculture, could we imagine a polyculture of knowledge. I'm going to go right. I'm sorry to have to skip through all these, but I'm going to so we can finish up here. What I am trying to imagine is could we have knowledge systems where traditional knowledge creates the intellectual scaffold for inquiry that then guides scientific knowledge? The bean being the scientific knowledge, the corn being the elder knowledge of, of traditional knowledge. Um, and what would that look like if we did knowledge generation, which enabled these, these systems of knowledge to work together? 
These are some of the principles that we might arrive at. Could we do science which supports reciprocity, that promotes responsibility for knowledge? If the, the leaves of this corn plant, this intellectual scaffolding, are indigenous principles about what it means to live with respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. Could we, in fact, imagine a new NSF, at least south of the border, the National Science Foundation? What would it look like if we had the Native Science Foundation, um, where we work together with knowledge generation shaped by indigenous principles? Much more to say about this, of course. But let me stop with thinking about, well, what's the squash all about? If the corn is traditional ecological knowledge, the primary elder knowledge and principles. If the bean is that wandering science that could be guided, just like the corn guides the, the spiraling of the bean, because you know that bean is really curious, it's really powerful, it enriches the soil. But if you plant beans all by themselves, it's a mess, isn't it? Um, it's a real mess. But guided by corn, now we've got something. But then there's the squash in the garden. And the squash, as we know, creates the microclimate for the beans and the corn to flourish. And isn't that our work as educators, as researchers, as members of uh, the intellectual community of the, uni of the university to be the squash, to create what Willie Ermine called this ethical space of engagement where worldviews can coexist, where the beans and the squash work in complementary fashion to one another, where, where scientific knowledge is guided by these principles of, of traditional ecological knowledge. And this metaphor coming from the plant world is, is, is um, really, for me, a primary teacher of, of our work in thinking about how can we use both science and traditional knowledge in thinking about strategies for climate change resilience. And uh, I think I'll stop at that point so we have plenty of time for questions. Miigwech. Thank you.